Wednesday the 24th of April, 1912. Midnight. In the graveyard of the Church of St. Peter and St. Mary, men gather in silence on the edge of the drowned marshes, watching, waiting. For it is believed that, on the eve of St. Mark, the ghosts of those destined to die in the coming year will be seen walking into the church at the turning of the hour. It is a custom that has long died out in most parts of Sussex, but not here. Not here, where the saltwater estuary leads out to the sea. Not here, in the shadow of the old salt mill and the burnt ant remains of Far Hills Mill, its rotting timbers revealed at each low tide. Here, the old superstitions still hold sway. Skin, blood, bone. With the taxidermist's daughter, I realised that I've wanted to write about home always, but I had to go away from home to learn how to do it because I'm a person from Sussex. I am a Sicestrian, and when you're at home, really at home, and you have a deep sense of connection to a place, what are you? You're always somebody's daughter somebody's sister, somebody's mother, somebody's wife. Um, you're not writer, first and foremost. Going to France and finding that there were stories in that landscape that came to me and that I wanted to do. In Carcassonne, I was a writer first, all those other things second. And I realized that I couldn't have written about Sussex until I was ready and I'd learned how to do that. So everything about what makes Labyrinth, The Sepulchre, Citadel, The Winter Ghosts, the novels that they are. It, of course it's the history, it, of course it's the stories, of course it's the very particular thing of the Languedoc. On the surface, this looks like a radical departure because all of my writing really so far has been love letter to Carcassonne and the southwest of France. And people associate me with writing about that very particular type of landscape. But actually it's not a departure. I have a wonderful quotation by the great American writer of landscape, Willa Cather, who said, let your fiction grow from the land beneath your feet. That's the writer I am. It comes out of landscape. Stories and land are indistinguishable. You cannot separate them. And I feel that I walk in those footsteps more than um, anything else. So I didn't choose to write about Sussex. It's been waiting. I was brought up in a little village called Fishbourne, just outside of Chichester in West Sussex. And we moved there in sort of 1961, and I was there all the time until I was a grown-up. And one of the things about that sort of village was, um, it could have been 40 years before, almost 100 years before. So when you stand there as a novelist in that landscape, you are seeing nothing of today. You are only seeing those sort of flickering, almost, you know, they are black and white images. It's very odd how you find yourself being pulled into the, the language of film, which is not my area at all, really. Um, and that's how a novel comes to life. It, it peoples the landscape that you're writing about. And then it feels like a matter of recording it rather than making it up. It never feels like making it up. I was a very um, 
bookish child. Um, I fancied myself in the famous five, really. You know, I read all of those Enid Blyton books and I wanted to be out there uh, charging about finding adventures, falling down tin mines, no tin mines in Sussex. Um, but I spent a lot of time on my own out on the marshes. And we turn right at the duck pond and walk across the first little bridge and then the second bridge over a stream that when that tide was high swelled to quite a big river and then a tiny little third bridge and then you'd walk along the old seawall where the sluice gates used to be and at the low tide there was a path across the mud and the marshes and you could see the old mill that had burnt down um, but I didn't know what it was then I just knew that there were the remains of something and of course, as the tide comes in twice a day, that path goes. So there's only a couple of moments when you can get safely across the marshes. And I spend a lot of my time out there on my own. And it was the landscape of my imagination. I can see now. And I can see now that because I grew up there, um, I became a writer. I might not have done if I'd lived somewhere else. The museum that absolutely inspired the taxidermist's daughter in particular will be known to many, many people. And there was an extraordinary Victorian taxidermist, self-taught man, Sussex man. And he, over time, built up a tiny museum of taxidermy. And over years, it became one of the great tourist attractions of England. Walter Potter was one of those extraordinary self-taught Victorian taxidermists. The first thing that he stuffed was his own pet canary and then went on to his pet cat. But he created these extraordinary tableau based on a book of nursery rhymes that his sister had. And the very first thing he did was the death and burial of Cock Robin. And there are nearly 100 British birds in the display case. It's extraordinary. And I loved that museum and I never forgot that museum. Um, and there were some ghastly things in there as well, which in the way of childhood, you can be both seduced by and appalled by. People forgetting that taxidermy came out of science, came out of uh, preserving animals and saw it as a cruel thing and a, um, a very unethical thing. And so the collection was sold off. But a few years ago, there was an exhibition that tried to reunite some of that. And at that moment, I thought, that museum. And yes, I've been waiting to write a story about that, that beauty of taxidermy, the way that the birds tell their own story still, and that you look into their eyes and you think, who are you, crow? <laughs> you know, and, um, and out of that, I realized it's not that I set out to write about the museum. I'm not a non-fiction writer. I'm not a taxidermist. Um, vegetarian. <laughs> um, but I just realised that all those years, thanks to my parents taking me to that extraordinary place in the 70s, these long, lethargic weekend days of the 70s, you know, we forget now, nothing's open, <laughs> you know, everything is shut on a Sunday. Um, it never left me and it was a very deep sense of knowing that there was a story there, but you have to wait then, you have to be patient as a writer. You have to wait for the story to come and tap you on the shoulder. The story of the taxidermist's daughter comes partly out of research, discovering that although women laid out the dead, taxidermists were men. And I was just really intrigued by that in a funny sort of way, that women weren't taxidermists. I started to think, what would it be if your beloved father, for reasons that you didn't understand, had descended into a place of being unable to work? His eye was no longer true, his hand was no longer steady, but this is your livelihood. And I started to think of the sort of father that might have, without telling anybody and nobody quite knowing, it being a secret thing, handed on his skills to his daughter rather than a son. I could not write with any respect for the skill of taxidermist if I hadn't had the experience myself. So I found a very beautiful artist in taxidermy called Rose Robson and asked her if she would teach me to skin a crow. The 
delicacy of it is quite extraordinary. Holding a scalpel in my hand, opening up that bird and starting to peel back the skin and seeing the flesh inside and the feathers. And it was the most extraordinary experience. Will I be having a secondary career as a taxidermist? I will not. I knew that I, I wanted um, a female hero uh, because my novels tend to be led by female heroes. And I, I call them heroes because for me, the word hero means the protagonist. It means the person who is the engine of the story, who drives the story forward, the person who does stuff, uh, rather than being the subsidiary or secondary role, which for me, I'm afraid the word heroine still um, makes me think of princesses on hillsides <laughs> waiting to be rescued. Um, and so that's how Connie, the lead character, started to come to me. And then out of that is the idea of what might have happened to make her father become a man who can no longer really function. What, what happened in their childhood? So Connie lives with her father in 1912 in a very isolated house on the edge of the marshes in Fishbourne. It's deep, dark, tidal mud. If you miss your footing in the path at night, the mud will swallow you up very high reed mace up to your shoulders. When the wind blows, it's like the sound of rubbing hands, and it's like bones rubbing together. There is the sense of menace. Someone out there in the reed mace watching the house. The ice house in the garden that's filled with bell jars from the old museum. Who has sent that letter that is lying on the back doormat? saying, I am watching you. The rain just does not stop. And the tide, even when it's low, is still too high. And it's coming in and coming in. And finally, the land and the water and the sky are the same. It's bleak. It's bleak and it's harsh and it's terrifying. Even in England, nature bites back. Taxidermist's Daughter is a very gothic novel. <laughs> Um, not simply because if you have a flood, if you have sinister carrion birds, not just because of taxidermy, but when you put all of those three together, obviously you're heading for a brooding, dark atmosphere. And little by little you find not that you as the author are making decisions to drive a story forward, but actually what's happening is, <laughs> horribly much like skinning a bird, you know, there is the bird. There is the story. It's just you as the author don't know it quite yet. But the minute you put that scalpel in and make that first cut down, everything starts to reveal itself. Skin, blood, bone.